Concrete is one of the most used building materials by the mankind, as you know. And concrete is also a very dirty industry. So it produces almost 7% of the global greenhouse gas emissions that we get. So what we're trying to do is to reduce that carbon footprint of the co concrete industry. The other problem that we're trying to solve here is that we also produce 3 billion tires every year in the world. And each tire, when it's uh, uh, recycled, in the end produces one kilogram of a fiber uh, per tire. So what we have developed is a process by which this fiber can go into concrete and it does several things. Not only you're actually using up the fiber, which goes into this very large concrete industry with six billion meter cubes of concrete needed every year, but it also improves the properties of concrete. Initial results from the laboratory tests indicates that scrap tire polymeric fibers actually enhances the performance of cement-based materials. And based on these results, we, we are currently carrying out a repair overlay project at the UBC campus. And thus far, the overlays reinforced with scrap tire polymeric fibers are actually performing better than the plain unreinforced segments. What you're doing is you're making concrete definitely much more resistant to uh, loading. You're making it more durable. And you know, when you combine all these things, what we're really doing is essentially recycling one product, which one industry doesn't know what to do with, the tire industry that is, and bringing it into the concrete industry, which has its own problems in terms of, you know, poor performance of concrete and its own greenhouse gas emission footprint, right? So we're actually solving both problems. But what we have done is we have reinforced it with types of fiber reinforcement which actually makes it extremely ductile. What that means is instead of fracturing, it would actually bend and continue to take stresses. Just to give you an example, an ADCC retrofitted, an unreinforced mezzanine wall can take shakings of up to about 200% level of the actual intensity of the 2011 Tohoku earthquake, which itself is a 9.1 magnitude, Richter magnitude event. The same wall without the retrofit will normally collapse at about 60 to 65 percent of the intensity of same ground. So at the moment we are using this retrofit technology at the Annie Jemison Elementary School uh, which is undergoing uh, the seismic retrofit right now uh, but this material will be also used for uh, more schools uh, you know upcoming in the next few months and, and close years uh, that are due for seismic upgrade.
Hello everyone, this is Satyadeep Mahapatra, President of Sage Club of NIT Raulkilla and host of today's session. On behalf of Sivinar Organizing Committee, I welcome you all to the second session of our webinar series, Sivinar. Sivinar is an online webinar come talk session organized by the Sage Club of NIT Raulkilla in collaboration with ICUK NIT Raulkilla chapter. In this present turmoil, Caused due to the pandemic that has swept across the whole world, we have come up with Sivinar to provide the entire civil community with a platform to gain and share knowledge in the field of civil engineering by noteworthy personalities from all over the world. In the first session, we are joined by esteemed professor Dr. Shriram Narsimhan of the University of Waterloo, who gave his talk on automation in bridge inspection. The link for the video is present in the description. You can view it after today's session. In today's session, we, we will ha have yet another remarkable personality from the University of British Columbia, Canada with us. Born and brought up in India, he pursued a field where he could create healthy communities and vibrant economies by creating proper infrastructure. For this, he did his master's in structural engineering from the reputed Indian Institute of Technology, IIT Delhi, and went to the University of British Columbia to pursue his doctorate. He is a distinguished professor and senior Canada research chair in infrastructure, rehabilitation, and sustainability at the University of British Columbia. He has done extensive work on performance of concrete structure under varied conditions of loading and developed novel sensors for structural health monitoring. In his glorious career of 25 years, he holds seven patents to his name, has published over 400 referred papers and edited 20 volumes. He serves on the editorial board of eight international journals and is the editor-in-chief of the Journal of Cement and Concrete Composites. Under his dynamic leadership as the scientific director and CEO of the India-Canada Center for Innovative Multidisciplinary Partnerships to accelerate community transformation and sustainability, that is IC impacts. It has worked in 52 Indo-Canadian projects with 311 partners, trained about 946 innovators, published about 970 scientific publications, and holds 28 patents till date. Honored with many pre uh, uh, prestigious awards and accolades, such as the Fellow of the Royal Society of Canada, Washington Medal of American Concrete Institute, Wilson Merit Award of the Royal Society of the UK, and Global CSR Medal of Leadership and Excellence. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to this speaker, Professor Neem Kumar Nemi Banthia from University of British Columbia, Canada. Thank you, Satyadeep. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Very good. Thank you for the opportunity to present. Uh, do you want me to start? Sir, sir, with your permission, I would like to announce to our audience. Sure. This webinar will be followed by the question and answer session. For this, we will be picking questions from the live comment section. Therefore, um, the audience are advised to submit their questions at live comment section. Without wasting any precious moment, uh, sir, please continue with your presentation. Thank you very much. Can you please share my screen? Oh, okay, perfect. Can everybody see this? Okay. Can you all see this? Can Satyadeep, can you see this, Shabam? Yes, sir. It's uh, visible, sir. Okay, very good. Thank you again for the opportunity. Uh, instead of talking specifically about my research, what I thought might be an interesting idea is to present the work of our center. It's IC Impacts, as Satyadeep just mentioned. It's a Canada-India center that was launched uh, seven years ago. Now, the reason why I'm telling you about this is because it, it presents a great deal of multidisciplinary work. Uh, there are opportunities for students, there are opportunities for faculty, and there are also opportunities for uh, companies to work with us. And then clearly at this stage, I think uh, what I'd like to impress upon you is that solutions that we require for our community transformation to improve lives of people 
are always multidisciplinary. Uh, you can never remain narrow in one discipline and expect to find elegant solutions. So that's why the work of the center is very important because it brings in huge number of disciplines together, 66 disciplines to be precise, and works with, uh, creates kind of this uh, synergy between disciplines. And that's the reason why the heart, instead of presenting my personal work, I'd like to present you a much broader view of really where research is going in terms of uh, the work that IC Impacts is doing. So uh, title is IC Impacts, Canada and Research Center. And specifically, I want to talk about science for the people. Uh, this is really an effort which brings in ability for us in the academic sector to work with communities to improve the lives and to come up with low cost solutions so that it can change people's lives uh, as 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 best as we can uh, as we can so so what is ic impacts so ic impacts is first and only international network of centers of excellence uh, as you can see uh, or my, my, you must realize india has definitely a number of collaborations with other countries but this particular one is very unique in that sense that I think it's one which actually integrates number of other factors into collaborating with the company so it's diplomacy it's science diplomacy at its best the center is pan Canadian pan Indian which means that anybody from India or anybody from Canada can participate and it's equally funded by Canada and India and I'll talk about really the, the Indian agencies that are involved with us at the moment. It's a co-innovation model. It's not a model which looks at only Canadian technologies being developed and then placed into Indian communities or imported into India. This is a co-innovation model. What that means is we recognize the strength of India, uh, we recognize the strength of Canada, and then we work together with Canada and India in order to develop solutions which are uh, co-innovated, which means that uh, they are all equally important, Canadian, Indian teams, Canadian teams, and there is no one-way transfer of ideas. There's always a bilateral transfer of ideas. And India has a lot of strengths in the number of disciplines, space, for example, uh, environmental technologies, for example, and we want to tap into those complementary expertise uh, from the Canadian side so that we can develop solutions for both communities. Finally, the whole purpose is to improve lives. We are in integrating all these thoughts into one large purpose of improving lives in our community. So that's a much larger, broader goal that we have in front of us. So what we have done so far, and this might be, uh, in fact, relevant to uh, all of you because there is a number of entry points into the program uh, for all of you to join hands with IC Impacts, either as a student or as a faculty or as, a, as an industry. We have launched 63 bilateral research projects, and I'll describe some of the ongoing projects a little bit later. It has got 24 technology deployments, and the reason why technology deployment into your community is very important for us is that we are not doing science for the sake of publishing here. We are not doing research for the sake of publishing. What we really want is that these technologies should go into communities uh, in our lifespan, which means that during the lifespan of the center, we want to place all of these technologies into communities. So we are funding research at much, much higher TRLs. Um, a TRL is a technology readiness level, so we really fund projects which are fi fairly advanced. The proof of concept has been uh, demonstrated, and then we want to take these technologies into communities. We have 274 researchers involved in the program, uh, which is half and half, literally half from Canada and half from India. So a number of Indian researchers are involved, and I'm sure whichever institute you come from, there is a very high likelihood that many researchers from your institution are involved in this program. We have 352 network partners. These are industries, these are government agencies, these are not-for-profits who are all part of this network. Uh, there are 70 companies involved in this program at the moment, which are, say, 35 from India and, and 35 from Canada. And these are all the large companies that I'm sure you know of, Tata's, for example, Reliance, for example, they are partners in this program. 
We have come up with 29 patents and technology disclosures. Uh, again, as I said, we need technology deployments, and we are funding higher DRLs, technology readiness level projects, which means that we are fast tracking this into creating patents. And these are Canada India joint patents, which is wonderful because then you already have an opportunity to develop further trade and have startups, which means that there are seven startups. These are seven companies that have been launched, and there is an eighth company we are just very close to launching now, which would be wonderful, I think, to see Indian students launching companies with Canadian students, which are uh, going to eventually transform the trade. Uh, our outcome is in research publications, so there have been 1,129 uh, journal papers that have come out of the program and more than 1,000 HQP. What HQP is a term we use, which is uh, highly qualified professionals. These are master's and PhD students. And of course, there are also a number of undergraduate students involved, not counted here, of course, but there are also a number of undergraduates involved in the program itself. So uh, this is uh, really a uh, very heartening and in fact, very proud moment for us to declare that we have trained uh, more than 1,000 Canada, India, uh, 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 HQP or research uh, uh, postgraduate research students who have worked with each other so these are not working in vacuum they're working on joint projects which is absolutely creating this long-term friendship between Indian and Canadian students which will eventually transform our relationship between the two countries through these grassroots innovations through these grassroots students who can then go ahead and do wonderful things so I personally as the CEO and scientific director believe that Clearly, the real impact of IC impacts will be felt 10 years, 20 years, 30 years down the road when these HQPs who had known each other, have worked with each other, will transform, in fact, our relationship between the two countries. So these are our partners and collaborators. As I said, there are a number of them, more than, more than 300 now. Uh, you will notice, uh, of course, uh, uh, Xerox, Reliance, Tata's, number of universities, number of um, departments of technology, uh, DST, for example, uh, DBT, for example, and number of universities who are also part of uh, our global makeup of uh, international partners, which is excellent. And some of these are also uh, uh, international. There are some companies from Europe that are participating. There's some number of companies from the United States that are participating in this kind of a Canada-India model, which is really very heartening to see and it's, exact, uh, it's, it's very um, uh, clearly, in fact, uh, speaks to the broader international impact of the program itself. Here is our current network. Uh, this, uh, there are a number of uh, institutions, number of uh, companies, number of not-for-profit in India and Canada collaborating with each other, and I'm sure there is one close to you. There are also demonstration projects that I'll talk about which represent one specific dot on the map there, and you'll notice that maybe there is a likelihood that there is a demonstration project off the center closer to where you are or is coming to closer to where you are. These are our four pillars, students, faculty, industry, and community. As you see at the bottom, these, this is a large network which entertains uh, all these stakeholders and serves their purpose, students, faculty, industry, and community. And as I said, you can, in fact, be participating from any of these groups to m further the, the, um, the broader uh, goals of this particular network. So what do we actually do? Uh, we are in three broader disciplines. This is, of course, expanding now as we go into the next phase of IC impacts. But in the current phase, we have three areas, safe and sustainable infrastructure. Uh, anybody from India will recognize that, in fact, infrastructure is the backbone of any, any community, any city, any village. Um, any uh, large urban area, we need infrastructure. We need roads. We need bridges. Uh, we need a uh, number, uh, number of such uh, installations which actually make our, pr our lives productive, make our communities healthier. So there we are working on low carbon materials. We are looking at sensors. Uh, which can be placed into these uh, into these infrastructure um, or into these structures, and that can tell us exactly what the condition of the structures are. So, for example, there have been a number of failures. For example, a chimney that collapsed in Chhattisgarh. For example, uh, there are a number of bridges that have collapsed in India. And if you had these sensors installed on these bridges, you would know way ahead of time 
that the structure has come very close to its actual capacity and you, there could be a potential problem with a structural collapse and then I think these are the sensors which are then monitored on the internet will be able to tell you what the actual condition of the structure is and then you know if you know the condition of a structure, you can strengthen them. So we are also looking at strengthening technologies whereby you can guard lives, we can protect lives, and we can actually uh, maintain these structures for a much longer use for our many generations to come. We are also in the integrated water management area. Uh, again, it's working on sensors. So looking at essentially sensors that can monitor both chemicals and pathogens in, con in, in water. To think about this, uh, for example, there's almost 300 million Indians that don't have access, unfortunately, to, to, uh, to clean water. And if you're looking at a uh, number of instances where I think if you had either uh, water treatment technologies or sensors in your network, which can tell you that in fact there is a horrible pathogen that is cryptosporidium or, or E. coli that has actually entered our water system, these sensors will be very quickly able to tell you that there's indeed in somewhere in the network you're having this kind of a problem, which will allow you to basically um, do some sense of some sort of um, uh, you know, treatment or take some mitigated measures. So we are looking at also water treatment methods uh, for uh, for this purposes. Uh, last and not, not least is the public health, where we're looking at rapid diagnostic services, uh, lab on chip sensors. These are sensors which can detect through a bodily fluid. It could be uh, could be blood or, or saliva, which could actually measure if there is a pathogen load on it. And there is a work going on also with the with the coronavirus right now, looking at basically can simply you could detect this by a lab on chip sensor concept. We're looking at infectious and waterborne diseases and finally mobile health technologies. India, for example, has over 900 cell phones and I believe that mobile health technologies are the right technologies for India where in many, many, many communities you don't even have primary health services. So clearly, but they do have a cell phone which means that you can use some of these mobile health technologies for improving the lives of people in India and, and as well as in Canada as I will describe a little bit later. So these are, now as I said, every solution that we develop is never possible to develop that solution by sticking to your very narrow discipline. So civil engineering, for example, which could be a discipline, needs to work with electrical engineering, needs to work with material science, needs to work with health, um, uh, with, with medicine, in order to develop solutions, for example, for our water infrastructure, for our buildings. You need to integrate these things. So we are looking at 66 disciplines that are coming together in our network, such as public health, microbiology, forestry, pathology, environmental engineering, uh, etc., which are coming together to come up with all these wonderful, um, you know, holistic, elegant, and multidisciplinary solutions to our problems. Uh, and, and this is really the strength of the network. We should never be working in isolation. We should always work with each other in order to produce solutions that are needed for the community. And in fact, there is a cost factor as well. We can, while working in our uh, you know, narrow discipline can come up with a solution which may not be the most elegant, which may not be the most cost effective one, but you work together with other disciplines who may have already solved the problem in some other context, which means that if you adopt that for the problem at hand, you can definitely work with number of uh, uh, coming up with basically uh, elegant and cost effective solutions. So this is very critical. And I think if you are an undergraduate student, I would really impress upon you that uh, try to look outside of your discipline, try to actually go into other disciplines, expose yourself to as many other disciplines as possible, because that's where your your long term wins and long term goals should be is to work in a multidisciplinary uh, format. As I said, our research network is global now. So you have, of course, Canada and India, but there are lots and lots of projects we have where there is also European counterparts involved, American counterparts involved, European companies involved, American companies involved. So this is, again, uh, we don't see it as a narrow uh, uh, you know, interaction between Canada and India. There are a number of other um, partners involved which are around the around the world uh, which are contributing to our our uh, programs here at the moment oh. so that 
brings me to the end of my talk. Uh, you're all welcome to uh, go on our website, icimpacts.com. Uh, I be and you can just always follow me on Twitter, which is at, at nbanthia. That's my Twitter handle, or also uh, follow us on Twitter. IC Impacts has got at IC Impacts as our Twitter handle. Uh, there's also a Facebook page. Uh, please stay connected. I'll be happy to answer any questions. It was certainly an opportunity. Thank you so much to all of you for listening to me. Uh, I hope this was a useful presentation. And I will again thank you to the organizing group for having me. And uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir, for uh, uh, sharing with us such a wonderful experience. Now we will be going for question and answer session. For the first question, it is from Dr. Subodit Mandal. What is the procedure to apply for such projects? So the best thing is to look for, it's a very good question. Um, best thing is to look for a call for proposals, either for a demonstration project or for uh, uh, a research project. And we already have a call for demonstration projects, which is on our website right now. But you will have to work with the faculty um, and a company. So if you have an idea, either you're a faculty or a student who's working with uh, uh, a faculty uh, or a company go uh, onto our website and apply for a project so based on a call for proposals next question is from Sumir Anjan Sao sir can you please explain your creating wealth from waste project so what happens is generally uh, uh, you take the waste and you go dump it generally you go and dump it into a landfill and landfills are filling up very rapidly. And in India, there is, of course, there's no place for landfill now. Uh, you know, in populated countries like uh, Japan, uh, India, <clears throat> even even Brazil, there is really no place for landfill uh, or to place any of this waste. So what do you do? Uh, one thing is to actually recycle them. And out of the things, three things that recycle, reuse, and reduce, what we call three R's, uh, I believe that recycling is something that should be always our last resort. So reduce and, and um, reuse are really the right ways of actually creating sustainability. But the other way to create sustainability is to take the same waste and actually create what we call a circular economy where what we call industrial ecology. So you take the same waste, which may be waste to one industry, or it may be a house, household waste, but it may prove to be a resource for another industry. So I'll give you an example. If you look at fly ash, you look at Meda Kalin, you look at blast furnace slag, these are materials which are, uh, which are waste for the energy industry, but these are resources for the infrastructure industry. So what you could do is you could take this waste and actually convert that into a value added stream which becomes a wealth for another company or another sector. This is really what we call uh, industrial ecology and that's what's creating wealth from waste means. Is that clear? Thank you. Yeah. Um, sir, next question from Nisan Bhatta. Sir, do you think that some type of interdisciplinary curriculum should be introduced in undergraduate courses? That's a fantastic question. Absolutely. I really believe that the way for a much broader, a much holistic learning is always through multidisciplinary curriculum. Now we have a challenge, of course, because within the four years you have to cover a lot, clearly. And there is generally less of a room for creating multidisciplinary courses. However, you need to start somewhere. And one uh, area uh, where we think there is a great possibility of creating an interdisciplinary curriculum should be through uh, project-based learning. So you create a project, you create a, uh, a problem statement and then you let the students actually work towards solving that problem. So we have a similar pro project here 
uh, a course here in civil engineering where uh, uh, they, through project-based learning, they can solve a specific problem. And in order to solve that problem, they have to go into other disciplines and understand how the other disciplines actually can promote a specific solution to the problem they have it in hand. So I believe, I think the time has come to change, change our pedagogical model and bring a lot more interdisciplinary uh, curriculum into our uh, undergraduate courses. Very important. So next question is from Armande Puan. What role do you expect from the undergraduates slash postgraduates? What qualities do you look in them while taking them in your projects? The most important thing for me when I take a PhD student or a master's student is your background, is your formation, is how much you understand fundamentals and yes your grades are very important uh, don't don't underestimate the, the the performance in your courses is very important to us you can certainly appear for gre and other types of aptitude exams and they also give us really what your uh, broader um, uh, you know formation has been but the second thing i look for is your is is your uh, breadth uh, uh, how much have you understood really the the overall problem that you're going to eventually work on how motivated you are to solve that specific problem at hand uh, yes I think the first part may be uh, you may be a uh, <laughs> uh, for a lack of a better word a bookworm who has got some very good grades but that's not enough. I think we also want you to be dedicated to finding a solution. You need to be motivated towards research and you should truly enjoy doing research. And that's really what I look for a graduate student. Thank you, sir. So next question is from Aditya Ranjan Kara. Sir, in fiber reinforcement pavement, the main problem is orientation of fiber and uniformly distribution of fiber in the pavement. So during mass con con concentration of the pavement in the field, how it is achieved? Very good question, Adit. Uh, so this, this question uh, has been um, a very daunting question for anybody using fiber reinforced concrete, uh, no doubt about that. But uh, this question was an issue about 20 years ago. Today, we have such exciting methods of mixing, such exciting methods of dispersion, uh, number of new admixtures. Uh, we understand now how to distribute uh, fibers in concrete to achieve a, a proper three-dimensional distribution through uh, you know, uh, mixing methods to admixtures, etc. So at the moment that that problem has already been solved, we can create uh, any type of concrete, it could be mass concreting, it could be pavements, it could be any material that you're placing, either thin placement or thick placement, and you would be able to get very good dispersion of fibers. That's really not a problem. One area is where you're starting to actually use larger volume fractions of fibers. Now, for small volume fractions, it's never been a problem, and we always knew that. But for large volume fractions of fibers, uh, there are, again, methods of uh, high shear mixing, uh, large dosages of dispersing agents, uh, sometimes even dispersing agents such as methyl cellulose and silica fume are very good in terms of creating that dispersion. Uh, but I think we know how to create uh, proper dispersion in these fibers, even at high volume fraction systems. So it's not, a, not an issue. Thank you, sir. So next question is from Nipper. Sir, hypothyroid is a silent epidemic in India affecting middle-aged ladies. This could be due to high iodine content in cooking salt. Are there any projects addressing this problem? It's a very good problem, uh, very good uh, question. Uh, unfortunately, not at the moment uh, with IC impacts that we have a project on looking at the effect of iodine on the uh, thyroid problems in middle-aged ladies. No, unfortunately not. Thank you, sir. Next question is from Chaitanya Kumar. How cost effective are the self-filling roads and can they be constructed at large scales? 
Uh, great question, Chaitanya. Uh, these are very cost effective. As I said, the project that we did in Tornibhavi, where we built this one kilometer long uh, self-healing road, it cost only about 50% of what India spends on building a kilometer road. So these are very cost effective, um, even on the first cost basis or first time cost basis. So, you know, you always look at two things. You look at the first time cost and then you look at the life cycle cost. So even based on the first time cost, this material and this type of a construction technology is very cost effective. And uh, even on the life cycle cost basis, it's even more effective because you're going to have a road which is going to last longer. So on both first time cost and life, life cycle cost, these, these uh, road systems, self-healing road systems are highly cost effective. And clearly they can be constructed at large scale, absolutely no problem. Uh, you could build, I don't know, 300 kilometers of this road, absolutely no problem at all. Next question is from Sagar Tripathi. For MS science student at, UB, at University of British Columbia, Vancouver, the funding which they receive through RAT positions, is it sufficient for the expenses or you encourage students to apply for other scholarships? So, uh, good question, Sagar. Um, uh, uh, Vancouver tends to be, it depends on where you're going, of course. So if you go come to UBC, Vancouver tends to be an expensive city. But I would say, you know, with the scholarships we provide, um, uh, it should be sufficient for you to survive. Uh, but you also are highly encouraged to apply for uh, teaching assistantships uh, and also apply for other scholarships uh, to, uh, to, to sort of supplement your income. Uh, Depends on a bunch of other factors, of course. If you have family with you, you require additional resources to support them. So in, in each of these instances, I would definitely recommend uh, that you apply for other scholarships and get some additional sources of income. Sir, as our session has gone for one hour now, so this will be our last question from okay. Jyoti Mato. Sir, in UP, UHPC, Urban Health Pro uh, Urban Person. In UP, UHPC, aspect ratio of fibers is uh, important parameters for the tensile strength of the concrete. So what about using the powder for fibers? Uh, Jyoti, that's a good question. Uh, if it's in the powder form, it stops being a fiber because you do require aspect ratio for the fiber uh, to be effective as a fiber in, in UHPC or UHPFRC. So, uh, and since tensile strength basically is coming from the aspect ratio and essentially the interfacial surface, uh, clearly you do require a certain high aspect ratio from the fibers, generally exceeding about 100. So a powder which would have an aspect ratio of one is clearly not going to give you an increase in um, in the tensile strength of UHPC. It may be used as a filler. It's going to act as a filler because it's a powdered filler, for example, but it would actually be the dominant place where the failure will occur because there's no aspect ratio in these particles and hence you will not see a benefit in the tensile strength. So that's all for today's question session. Thank you, sir, for joining. Now I will like to call Subham Das, our organizing secretary, for both of thanks. Hello, everyone. Uh, myself, Subham Das, a third year undergraduate from the Department of Civil Engineering of NIT Raukela. I am one of the organizing secretaries for the event seminar. First of all, we all are extremely grateful to Mr. Nem Kumar Bantia, sir for taking his precious time and effort to deliver this webinar on IC impacts. In doing so, he helped us understand the work of IC impacts and it's truly visionary. Sir, thanks for having us know the importance of internal international organizations like IC impacts and how they transform into communities and the role of a civil, civil engineer could play in that. I am sure that uh, everything you told us will forever be with us. I would also like to thank NITR and SEC for giving us this chance and such constant encouragements to do such events which help us grow and develop. And of course, the webinar would not be complete without the lovely audience. Thus, I would like to thank you all for that, uh, for attending and making it a success. 
last but not the least i would like to thank the organizing team for this event who put tireless hours into making this event possible and seeing it through thank you all for turning up for the session we hope all of you are keeping safe and doing well we will have more such interesting sessions on the upcoming days so stay tuned